Welcome, friends, to North Shore Fellowship Online. We're glad that you're here. It's a great day, even though this is the final Sunday of summer 2020. But while it's the final Sunday of summer 2020, it's the beginning of a brand new season. We just celebrated Feast of Tabernacles, which is the new year, the head of the year. And there's so much more in store. What we have today is worship, some prayer, and a message that I really want you to hear. And I also want you to share. So would you do me a favor? Just share this link. Go ahead and share it on your Facebook page or send the YouTube link. You could do that by copying the link and sending it. Why? Because that's how we invite friends to church. And when they do, who knows? Who knows? They may experience the goodness of God just like you do. I have people, friends, family members that I just want to experience Jesus the way you and I do. Well, the best thing to do is just share the link and let's all come to the Lord's table. Let's all come and, and taste and see that the Lord is good. He says, if you're thirsty, come drink from the waters of life, the waters of life. So that's my prayer for you today. It's my prayer for me as we worship, as we pray, as we get into the word. And why don't we pray that all of that happens right now? Would you join me? Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this beautiful day and the season that we're in. We believe that we're not here by chance, that you directed or helped us to get to the place where we are right now. And you have something for us. You have something from your word, something from your spirit that will fill the empty spaces that we drag around inside of us. You want us to be filled with the water of life. So make us thirsty so we drink deeply. And then for our part, help us to worship you. Help us to give you glory and praise and exaltation and gratitude. So would you bless all that takes place today? Everything that is said and sung, anything that takes place online here at North Shore Fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than my unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, my king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness free. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you have to hold on me. And I'm gonna see Sing a little louder. 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 In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than my unbelief. Sing a 
little louder My weapon is a melody Sing a little louder Without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. Death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested.
and welcome to you all. It is great to be with you again. Let's dig right in and look at some of the upcoming events. We have some that are happening very soon, as in today. Sunday, September the 20th, we have the North Shore West Outdoor Worship Service and Picnic. We're going to be at Homedale Park. You go into the park and just follow the signs to the Hilltop Picnic Pavilion. We start at 11 a.m. with an outdoor acoustic worship service. So come on out and join us for that. At 12.15, we have an all-church picnic. You bring your bag, lunch, or some snacks. We'll provide the water, soft drinks, and watermelon. We're going to have a great time together. Lots of fellowship and plenty of activities for the kids. Hey, we do want to let you know about a schedule change. The baptism event that was scheduled for later today will be moved off by one week to September the 27th. There were concerns about the surf being too rough. So if you are interested in being baptized next Sunday the 27th, if you would please email Pastor Raphael. I want to let you know about another event, the October Festival of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, the Festival of Booths. This is a chance to explore our Jewish roots and find the blessing in this ancient tradition. So here's what you can do. You can sign up and get instructions. You can get the daily devotions. You can get a Sukkot building how-to. And all of this is going to culminate on Friday, October the 9th, with a live broadcast of our Festival of Tabernacles 2020. If you are at all interested, just send an email to Pastor Bill Acey at his email address. I want to remind you just the regular schedule that we keep on Sundays. We do have our outdoor Sunday service for those that want to meet in person. That's at the Peninsula location. And then, of course, a half an hour before that for uh, pre-service prayer. For those of you who participate online, Sundays at 9 and 10.30 a.m., we premiere on Facebook and YouTube. Wednesday, we have Worship in the Word at 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live with Pastor Raphael and Allie. Hey, we also want to let you know that all of the small groups are up and running and there are activities being added all the time. So to stay informed, you just need to send your name and contact information to us at info at northshorenj.org and all of it will just come right to you. We remind you that we have our website where we post a lot of information. We have a Facebook page and a YouTube channel, lots of things there to watch and to share. So, hey, get out there, get connected, join in and enjoy. But please do stay safe. Thank you so very much. This next song will be for our offering. We are always grateful to the Lord for his many blessings and for his provision. And this is our opportunity to give just a small portion back for his work and to see that the gospel message goes out. We invite you all to participate in the work and mission that we have here at North Shore Fellowship. If you'd like to join us financially, if you would go to the website and find the word give, you can find multiple ways for your donation to be submitted. We always do say thank you to all of you who have remained faithful in your giving. So please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you and Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide for all that you give. Father, we ask that you would take this portion back, that you would direct it and that you would use it as you see fit. Make us wise in all the things that you would have us to do. Be with us this day and be pleased in all that we do here at North Shore Fellowship. Father, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Welcome everyone, let's pray together. Oh Lord God, thank you God that you are our God and you love us. Thank you Lord that you wanna draw near to us as we draw near to you. Thank you Lord that we can just come before you and bring you our requests and lay them at your feet and you're concerned and you care. Lord, we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for you, our heavenly father who's such a good, good father to us. Lord, we're just coming before you with so many concerns. We continue to bring the COVID crisis to you, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just bring an end to it quickly. We're praying also, Lord, for a division in our country and in the world, Lord. We know that you know all about it. And Lord, we just wanna be used by you to be unifiers and that we would be drawn by your spirit to do things and say things that would unify people. Lord, would you help us just to follow your spirit, that we would walk in step with your spirit, Lord. Lord, so many also in, our, in and out of our congregation that need your healing touch, Lord, we bring them before you. We pray, God, that you would just pour out your healing and your tender mercies over people, Lord, especially ones that are in the hospital that can't get a lot of visitors, Lord. We do pray, God, that you would just meet them in that place, Lord. And Lord, for many that have lost loved ones, Lord, we are praying, God, that you would just be with them, comfort them, Lord. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And we're grateful for this church. We're grateful for North Shore Fellowship. Lord, use us, Lord, as a church, God. We love you so much and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer for anything, please reach out to us. You can email us at prayer at northshorenj.org. Well, friends, we are continuing our journey, Eyes on Jesus. And can, can you believe that this is the final weekend of summer? Oh, wow. We're finishing up summer, but we are entering into a brand new season. 
And even in our journey, we're in a brand new spot in Jesus' journey. He is in Jerusalem. As you know, Jesus' life all the way through from the time he collected his apostles in the very beginning, starting to do miracles, he became very renowned, very popular, always saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. And when I do, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And this is where it's all happening. Just a couple weeks ago, we talked about the triumphal entry. Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. Last week, we saw him cleanse the temple and start to teach in the temple. And so this holy week, there's a lot of teaching going on and we don't want to miss it. From between the triumphal entry to the cross and resurrection weekend, there's a lot of great stuff that Jesus said and did. And that's exactly what we're focusing on on our journey, Eyes on Jesus. Now, it's interesting that here in the natural, in our year, 2020, we're entering into the season of the fall feasts. But where we're looking in scripture, they are entering into the season of the spring feast, starting with Passover. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun way to look at these scriptures out of seasonal context. Sometimes it makes you have a fresh perspective. So when we look into the scripture, something I want to identify and I want to focus on. Today, we're going to look at Jesus' authority. As we see him teaching and doing things in Jerusalem in his final week leading up to the cross, we're going to look at Jesus in terms of his authority. So turn with me to Mark 11, and we'll look at 27 through 23. They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it amongst themselves, and they said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. In, these, in this section, the religious authorities, the chief priests and the elders, they're questioning Jesus' authority. Who is this guy? Who is this Jesus? He just arrived in Jerusalem on a donkey. Does he think he's the Messiah? Apparently, everyone else did. And they wanted to oppose him publicly, but they were afraid of public opinion. And you see that. They were afraid of what the people would say of him or about him because they were rapidly losing credibility. First, to John the Baptist, who everyone was determined and believed was a prophet, a real legitimate prophet of the Lord. And now what they're seeing is they're losing even more of their credibility and their popularity to this guy, Jesus, who people believe he's the Messiah. He just came in on a donkey and they were shouting Hosanna from Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is a, a Messiah praise, a Messiah cry, a, a Messiah proclamation. So they're really getting edgy about Jesus. Now, after this encounter, Jesus responds with parables. He speaks to them in parables. In the Gospel of Matthew, when we get to this point in Jesus' journey, he offers three parables. The parable of the two sons, the parable of the wedding feast, and the parable of the wicked vine dressers. Now, in Luke and Mark, Mark is where we are at, they only, he only is presented the, uh, the wicked vine dressers, and that's what we're going to look at. But it's, it's important to know that each parable that Jesus gives, it is packed with significant meaning. And in this one, he's pronouncing judgment upon these three groups, the elders and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the priests. And so when they're hearing him speak this parable, they are getting the point. Jesus is talking about them. Now, Jesus spoke in parables often. And you know what they are? They're short allegorical stories and they have a covert message, a message that's, that's hidden. And it's sometimes they're misinterpreted. Um, but parables usually only have one meaning, usually only have one uh, moral, if you will, of the story. And Jesus makes up these parables in a really brilliant way. You know, we don't often think of Jesus as a creative artist. Like, you know, some people as songwriters, some people as authors. Jesus really was a, 
a, a short story author. If you look at his parables, and they're brilliant. They're, he's an ancient short story author. Now, he didn't, as far as we know, didn't scribe them, but he made them up. He authored them. Um, and it's interesting. If you collected all his parables, I think there's almost about 50 parables, and you put them in a volume and you put them in a, in a bookstore, they don't necessarily go in the religious section, even though Jesus obviously is the most iconic religious figure in the history of the world. But his stories are very much like Homer or Aesop or, or one of the ancient storytellers. And they weren't about, you know, angels and, and prophets and things like that. They were about farmers and sheep and sons and goats and planting and kings and things like that. Common elements to his story so that he could bring forth a common meaning that, we, that it's acceptable and applicable to the common person. And now they were brilliant. They had the plots, the character development, the, the settings, the themes. And, and like I said, there was always a significant meaning, sometimes known as a moral, to every one of them. What's interesting, listen, early on in his ministry, he would speak in these parables and the Pharisees were listening. Even when he started out way up in Galilee, they were listening and, and it would be this thing that didn't make sense to them. They knew there were some bad guys in them and there were some good guys in the parables, usually one bad guy. And they probably thought, wait a minute, is, is that us? But Jesus would never say. And it wasn't obvious, so he, they couldn't really pin him. But here in Holy Week, the final week leading up to the cross, absolutely, absolutely, he made it obvious that the antagonist, the bad guy in the story is the religious leader or the Pharisees or the chief priests. So let's get into the next chapter, Mark 12, where he responds to them saying, whose authority are you operating under? He responds to them with a parable. Mark 12, 1 says this, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, and others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants who give the vineyard and give the vineyards to others. Haven't you read the passage of scripture? Pause. Now, he's, a, he's about to quote a scripture that they, yes, they did know. They did know this scripture because just like the Psalm 118, Hosanna, this is the scripture that comes right before it in Psalm 118, a messianic scripture, a scripture pointing to the Messiah. And he's using in this context to show them how they have rejected the Messiah. And here's what it says. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Well, then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they let him, uh, they left him and went away. <laughs> they knew it. He was pinpointing them as those who were rejecting him, him as Messiah. And they now they are infuriated. They, they want to arrest him and they want to kill him. They wanted to kill him several times all along, but now they definitely want to kill him because he just gave this parable. And obviously in the parable, it's God who sends, you know, who, who owns everything. And just like this, this landowner or vineyard owner, he's sending people to collect the, what was payment for, for the rent, which would have been a share of the crops. But God is sending people prophets. And some of them they beaten, they, some they kill, they reject them. And finally, he's sending his own son whom he loves. It's interesting that he says that in verse six, because what do we see? 
that God loves his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And in the first, uh, the first time that the word love shows up in the Bible is Genesis 22. Do you remember that? And it's God speaking to Abraham about his proposed sacrifice of his son, which never went through. But he said, take your son whom you love. And here is what's going on in this parable. Jesus is the son of the vineyard owner, who is God, send, who is sent to collect. And the people these evil, wicked vine dressers, these wicked tenants killed him. It's interesting that they were about to kill him just a couple days later. Wow. So in this parable, Jesus clearly points out that they are those that are disobedient. They are the ones that will suffer rejection from God, not only as individuals, but as a people, as a people. I can just imagine the tension And I could just imagine how the Pharisees went away with, they were fuming, infuriated. Mark 12, 12, it says, Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd. They left him and went away. Keep in mind, they're afraid of the crowd. They want to get him. They want to kill him. They want to silence him. They want to put him to death. But the crowd is big, it's, it's massive at this point, and they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It's interesting because when they respond, they don't do it forcefully, they do it tactfully. So the very next thing they do is they come against Jesus in a way that's not to try to just grab him and take him out to a cross and nail him to a cross. They want to do it tactfully, strategically, where they'll dismantle his ministry. Well, they'll they'll publicly humiliate him. They'll publicly silence him and divide his following. That's really what they wanted to do. Now, what happens next is in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's his exchange with the Herodians, with the Pharisees, and with the teachers of the of the Sadducees. It's this exchange that's very popular. So we're going to look at it from Matthew. I know we're studying the Gospel of Mark. But Matthew is a little bit more illustrious. He gives a lot more uh, detail. And so I want to just look at it from Matthew's Gospels. They all say the same thing, and you'll recognize the exchange. But we're just going to switch tracks to Matthew. I remember when I was working in New York City, I would take the, uh, the New Jersey Transit from New Brunswick to Manhattan, and I had to get downtown. I had to get downtown to Canal Street. And so they had the ACE. And I can't even remember which one was the express and which one stopped every stop along the way. But when I had to get there fast, I would take the express. And that would be the one that just zooms down, doesn't doesn't stop at 14th Street, doesn't stop at the L train or any of those things. But if I had some time, I would just get on the the less crowded one. And it's usually the the local. We're going to get on the local. Same story. Matthew and Mark are going the exact same way. Matthew makes a a few more stops along the way. Matthew 12, 15 through 40. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Now bear in mind, the Herodians are those that are, that are loyal to Herod and want to see Herod sit on the throne of, of Israel. Um, the Pharisees want to see uh, a son of David. Just It's kind of a different... Uh, ethnicity, but they were all, they're all Jews and they were all against Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and you teach the way of God according to the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the taxes, and they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Now, he obviously wasn't blind. He could see that it was Caesar imprinted on the coin, but he wanted them to say it. And then he said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard him say this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Pause. You see, they wanted to trap him 
They wanted to publicly make him say, we should all be paying taxes to Caesar, because if he did, then all of these oppressed followers of his who have been paying these ridiculous extortionary taxes to Caesar will have just up and left him. You see, they were being taxed almost like, like slaves. Rome would come to Jerusalem, to Judea, and they'd see the Judean farmers and they'd say, great, you could keep farming. Even though we've conquered your land, keep farming. Farm your 100 acres of figs. But when we come for tax time, we want 80 acres for taxes and you just try to live on the 20. That's how ridiculous the taxation was. Different forms of those percentages throughout the first century. It was oppression. And if Jesus affirmed the taxation, well, you know that his followers who were being oppressed would have up and left. However, if he said, absolutely not, don't pay taxes to Caesar, well, then you know what would happen. It would have somehow found its ways to the ears of those Roman centurions that you have a tax revolt going on here from this tax revolutionary. And let's just pin him to a cross right away. But Jesus answered very, very brilliantly and strategically. That's when he said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and God's what is God's. And that's why they, it says there in verse 22, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Now, bear in mind, this is a three-fold attack. First, the Herodians, who you just heard from. Second will be the Sadducees, who you're about to see. And the final would be the, the lawyer of the Pharisees. So first, the Herodians. Then they ramp it up to the Sadducees. And then the final would be the, the lawyer of the Pharisees. That's the final showdown. But the phase two is when the Sadducees come. Now, Sadducees were upper class religious leaders. Um, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Very similar to the Pharisees, except for that one thing. Pharisees believe in the afterlife. Sadducees did not, which I've heard it said. That is why they're so sad, you see. Not my joke. No laughter going on around here. And here's what the Sadducees said. Verse 24, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there are seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. And since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third, right on down to the seventh. And finally, the woman died. Verse 28. Now then, at the resurrection, wait a minute. They're going to ask a question about the resurrection that they don't even believe in trying to trap him. <laughs> it doesn't get more hypocritical than that. So they say, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? And Jesus very brilliantly responds in verse 29, you're in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will, mar will neither marry nor be in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Now, that may not have astonished you as a response, but it astonished the crowds. They were dumbfounded. In fact, verse, the very, very next verse, 33, said, when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And the crowds became even more fervent about following him. You know, this attack, this strategic attack by the Pharisees had the opposite effect. Because Jesus, now bear in mind, he's showing his authority over them and his authority of the word of God. His authority was evident. It was, it was beaming in center city Jerusalem in front of all the crowds to see. And instead of him being divided and suppressed, he's becoming even more and more popular. Finally, the third attack. Finally, they sent a lawyer from the Pharisees, an expert of the law, and he was even more cunning. Verse 34, <clears throat> hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this question. And here it is. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Now, that seemed like a simple question, didn't it? A lot of people wonder what is the greatest commandment, whether it's the greatest of the Ten Commandments or the greatest of the 614 commandments and mitzvot throughout the Torah and the Tanakh. 
But it was a trick question because what it was designed to do was to have at least part of his crowd turn against him. Because early Jewish writers would say there were interminable disputes about what is the greatest commandment. Rabbis fighting against rabbis, factions fighting against other factions. And if Jesus made a statement about one of the commandments, you bet the rest would be either fighting him or just turning away and fleeing and dispersing. And Jesus responded and he responded with one of the most precious points of scripture, something that's known as the Shema, the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 and also in Leviticus 19. And Jesus responded to that question, which is the greatest commandment? He said, verse 37 says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But then he went on, verse 39, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Wow. He made a statement. He made a statement. You know, in in a simple version of the Bible that's known as the message, which is a real loose paraphrase, but just listen to how it reads. It said, the same passage. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second to go alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commands are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs on them. You see what he's saying? That the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that is to love God and to love others. He had such authority over the word of God that he even brought in these two elements, which were the most paramount elements in the faith, in the Hebrew faith. If you studied that, if you uh, were able to go inside the, the temple and, the, and the, the, uh, the, the, the scribes and the teachers of the law and what they were teaching about, what they were yearning for, what they felt that they were authorities over, it was definitely these two subjects. And they are the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets, the law, which is the Torah, and the prophets, which is the Nevi'im, the law and the prophets. The Torah, the law, are the words from God about God. The prophets, the Nevi'im, is that which was spoken from God and will come to pass. And Jesus taking these two authoritative things and saying all of those, these two things, hang on the two things I just said, He was saying the two greatest things in their entire faith hang on the two commandments, love God and love others. He swiftly and dramatically silenced his accusers. The very last verse of that chapter says, no one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Wow. He showed two things. He showed what is most important. What's most important? is to love God. And the second is just like it, and that's to love each other. That's the reason we're created. If you wanna know why you're walking around this earth for as many decades as you live, well, there's two purposes why. It's to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and might, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor may be your children, your spouse, people you've yet to meet. That's why you're here. Those are the important elements of life. But he showed something else. He showed that he had authority over the world and all that is in it, even the religious authorities. And he showed something in them that they neither loved God nor did they love each other. All they loved was themselves and protecting their power and their authority. You see, this is why the very first question they asked Jesus in our text today was back to Mark eleven twenty-eight. 28. The first thing they asked, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you authority to do this? Authority, authority. I read once that authority is a strong word. And when we hear the word authority, there's a certain force that comes with the word. There may be even a certain intimidation about the word. And we talk about the authorities and we rightly, rightfully respect authorities with a sense of awe and a, even a sense of fear. But the word authority denotes in ourselves or whoever has authority, denotes permission and privilege and power, rule, control, influence. 
When someone has authority, it means that they're on top of other people who are under their, their authority. They have responsibilities beyond the norm. And they're able to determine things and decide things. And get this, they are able to render judgment over others. Well, the Pharisees were used to having that type of authority where they could judge everyone in their purview, including Jesus. But he would not fit under their authority because he was authority over all things. And, G and the Pharisees recognized that and immediately found a plan to arrest him in private using Judas, blood money, having him arrested. You'll see when we get to that part of the scripture. You know, when we first started our journey, Eyes on Jesus, the Gospel of Mark, one of the first things we saw, first chapter, one of the first things we saw is when he was teaching. And it was in Mark 1.22. And when he was teaching, people were amazed at something. Do you remember what it was they were amazed at? We look at Mark 1.22. It says, the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. There's something different when you have authority, when you walk with authority, when you, you know, if you were able to spend the day with the president of the United States or the king or queen of a big country or something like that, and you see them walk with authority. Well, we walk with Jesus and he has authority over everything, all things. That's why he was never afraid of anything. He was never intimidated and he never lost hope. Yes, he struggled. We'll see in the Garden of Gethsemane, he struggled even to where he was dropping blood from his sweat pores. But he knew that God the Father, the creator of all things, is the authority over all things. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, formed the earth, made it, he established it, he didn't create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Can you imagine how you would feel? If your father created the whole world, world and everything in it and says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Imagine if your father was the ruler of the universe. Well, get what? guess what? He is. He is. Jesus calls our heavenly father, his heavenly father, our heavenly father. Matthew 6, 32. Remember, your heavenly father, your heavenly father knows your needs. See, that's why in these days we can't give up to give in to fear. You can't give in to worry. You know, we know what's going on. We have this pandemic. We have the virus. We have political conflicts. We have social unrest. We have things going wrong with the economy, weather, you know, storms. But there's nothing. There's nothing that we need to worry about. Don't worry about the world and everything in it because God has authority over the world and everything in it. Psalm 103 says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God will take care of us and protect us like a shepherd takes care of his sheep. Nothing comes to us unless it passes through God's hand first. Do you believe that? Do you trust that? Jesus proved that. You know, Matthew 28, 18, the start of the Great Commission, the beginning line of the Great Commission is this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus, all authority on heaven and earth has been given and given to me. And that was true of Jesus then. But remember, it's true of Jesus now. And you know what? Because Jesus was given authority, we are given authority. Because we're children of God, joint heirs with Jesus, the Bible tells us. No, that's not heretical. Romans 8, 15 through 17. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father, which is the same thing Jesus cries out. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Meaning we inherit our sonship with Jesus. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Let me close with this. When the devil tries to scare you and deceive you into thinking that you're not a child of God or that the powers of darkness are taking control of the world, remind yourself with these words. In fact, repeat them and hide these words in your heart. 
from 1 John 4.4. 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Friends, remember that. Hide that in your heart. Keep that in your mind as you walk forward. You have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in all the world. God bless you. Oh
Revelation 12, 11 says, they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Friends, you and I have authority over all things. Jesus has authority. And while we're in Christ Jesus, walk in that authority. Walk in that authority. Hey, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never said, yes, Lord, be my Lord, please reach out to us. We'd be glad to lead you in a prayer of salvation. Until then, stay in touch with us and be part of the the wonderful events that we do throughout the week. I'm glad you're here online on Sunday, but there's so much more to experience at North Shore Fellowship. But for today, have a fantastic day. Consider the words that God spoke to you and walk in his authority. God bless you. Have a great day.